All right, good morning and welcome to church today. We're excited to have you. We're going to worship today. Just start off with worship. Why don't you just stand up on your feet and we're going to give God some praise today.
said in John 14, 6, I am, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we respond by saying, you are the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And aren't you thankful for a great, wonderful God? And we're going to be celebrating his greatness over the next several weeks. And they're going to kick it off with some beautiful songs with the greatness of God. And I'm going to be ministering on that in just a little bit. We're so happy to have all of you with us today and uh, back on course a little bit after this massive snow and this cold spell that's just uh, uh, put us all in our homes. It's been uh, terrible cold around here. And being in Africa all those years, I hate ice. I hate <laughs> snow. I hate cold. And my furnace went out. The last two weeks I've been battling with my stupid furnace and this has been tragic for me. But uh, thank God it's getting warmer. It felt so good this morning and things melting around here. I appreciate uh, James uh, coming and, and shoveling the snow for us and uh, James Dean and shoveled all around the church. And then Tony came with a, uh, his company truck and plowed everything on Friday and looked so nice and being able to get in here. And so we're back in business again and we're looking forward to having you all uh, just enjoyed the service this morning. And I hope we don't have to close down again like we did last week. God is good. And uh, we will not be having service tonight because I've been having furnace problems and all kinds of situations. I have no, what, no clue what today is going to bring, but I know I was up most of the night last night dealing with a, a cold house and uh, difficult things, but we're, thank God it's looking a little bit better. So I uh, just wanted to know that uh, we, until we get things straightened out there and been putting in a new kitchen and a lot of things going on, driving us crazy. But uh, soon it'll be over with and we'll be back to a normal life again. But God is so good to your pastor. He is so good to my, my, my wife and I. We go to bed at night just blessing the Lord and thanking God for his amazing goodness. Even when the furnace was out. It wasn't kicking on, wouldn't kick on. And I took a screwdriver after the furnace guy there, and he looked at we couldn't figure it out. I took a screwdriver and beat it after he left and kicked on and worked for a couple hours. I thought, hey, that's the answer. So every time it acted up, I hit it with a screwdriver, and that worked until, worked until about 10 o'clock last night, and then it just shut down. But I got up this morning, hit it with a screwdriver again, came on. It worked from 6 to 9. So God is good, isn't he? Amen. And... Uh, you need your furnace fixed, just call me. I know exactly how to do it. I'll come with my screwdriver. God is good. Anyways, we're so happy uh, to let you know that we ha we're having Sunday, uh, Wednesday night Bible study and youth service, getting back on track. Appreciate uh, Brenda. You've been doing a fantastic job with Wednesday night. It's just been growing, and, and those pick the party they had a couple weeks ago was just super, and we appreciated uh, uh, all of that, and you've been just responding so well. You we don't want to miss that Wednesday night class. It's great. Well, uh, it's a big moment this morning for us. We appreciate uh, new members that come into our church. How many know we're a family? Yes. We're a family. And I love a family that just jumps in and uh, uh, get, sees that it's, it's not just about them, it's about the family of God. And I got a t call from Tony last week saying, hey, Brother Roy, uh, I plowed the church for you. I said, what? You plowed the church? I couldn't believe that. And he says, and if you need it plowed again, let me know, and I'll plow it again. I'm planning to plow it again if the snow comes in like it was going to. And plowed it, it looks so nice. And I was so blessed because Tony and Ashley, his wife here, Ashley, and the worship team, have just become members of our church. They've been coming for about a year and a half. And... Uh, Last month, they became members, been actually one month exactly today, but we couldn't introduce them to the church because if they were sick or things were happening or closed, church was closed down, we're happy to have them with us this morning. I love Tony. Uh, we just built a good, wonderful relationship and uh, see God working in his life just abundantly and appreciate his love for the Lord. And Ashley, uh, they, she's taken over the work of cleaning the church for uh, our custodian at the church from Wayne and Susie had done it for many years. And they just say, and to get a compliment from Wayne and Susie, you know it's coming from the heart. They say they're doing, she's doing tremendous. We love that. She cleans it. I come and I say, yeah, she really does a great job. It means so much. This is the house of God. But it's your house now. And it's your house. And I want you to come and just share a quick testimony of uh, your entrance into our church as members. God bless you, Tony. God bless you, Ashley. Oh, well, this was... Uh... This was, this was, this has been great. Um, family, yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head. That's what, that's what church means to me. And it, you know, I just, 
I've always wanted family. Family's always been number one, and you know, yeah. to have a have a go to, you know, with a family that's such tight knitted and you know, always there for you is, is extreme. You know, we'll, you know, pastor, you call at three in the morning, you know, to talk to. <laughs> So I appreciate every one of you, and thanks for letting me be a member of your church, and more importantly, a part of your family. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, so I'm emotional as usual, so I'm probably going to cry, but um, I'm so grateful for every single one of you guys um, being part of Bethel family is and just a family together, um, I couldn't ask for a better one. I don't have a whole lot of family, so I took some of you and <laughs> made you mine. <laughs> so thank you for that. And uh, I appreciate, you know, I'll say it again. Sister Susie was one of the first people who ever, um, well, actually, Sister Roy <laughs> was one of the first people who ever, um, how I got here. And God, of course, but... Uh, Sister Susie, and then Sister Brenda, and then Marie, and you know, they are, each one is so very special to me, Pastor Roy, is a great, um, very thankful to have him as a father figure to my husband, and um, I, I have never, this week was a very troubling and trying week for my family, and um, a lot of things happened. And whenever I can give a testimony that says that God is so good because he's the only person who can take something that can be so bad (laughs) and turn it around to be something incredible, completely different. And I, there's so grateful, so grateful. And God showed that God, God brought a family together this week and held hands and prayed some people that you never thought you'd see praying. (laughs) And he brought them together this week, and they prayed, and I believe that, I believe that everything happens for a reason. Yeah. There's no coincidences with God. It's not a coincidence that I, that Sister Roy came to my house, and it's not a coincidence that I became this, this he became my home. So, um, I am so grateful for every one of you, and um, I love every one of you, too, and thank you so much for having us as your family. God bless you. Thank you so much. God bless you. (laughs) Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the family of God. We thank you for Tony and Ashley and the wonderful work of grace that you're doing in their life and all of our lives, Lord. And I pray you draw us closer to you and closer to each other and that we'd be appreciate and love and spread that love amongst us, that, Lord, we would become one in one accord with you and with one another, that you might bless Bethel beyond measure for the glory of God. Have your way in this service. Minister through the worship and the songs and all the word that's going to come forth. And, Lord, may we exalt your greatness and your goodness to us this morning. And I will bless you for it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. 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 And amen. God bless you. Why don't we just stand back up on our feet and we'll worship God some more.
great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art. Yeah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Your ways are unsearchable, Lord. And our hearts and our mouths are filled with praise to you. For our, our minds cannot comprehend how great you are. But Lord, we exalt you. We exalt you. We exalt you this morning with everything that lies within us, God. We acknowledge you for who you are, the great and mighty God. Hallelujah. There's nothing you cannot do. And Lord, it's to you we look to even this morning that, Lord, you would shower down your blessing and your power upon your people across this land, across this world. And that, Lord, you would strengthen everyone, God, that calls upon your name to be able to stand strong in the Lord and in the power of your might. And that, Lord, your name would be exalted in this world for your glory. Lord, it's do help us to do that this morning, not just with praise, but, Lord, with hearts that are filled with God. And Lord, may your name be glorified today. Have your way in this service. Lord, we'll bless you for all that you do in every life, in every hurt, in every a struggle that everyone is having, Lord, as we bring it to you, bring great victory today in Jesus' name. We will give you the praise. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Appreciate the presence of the Lord. I was only going to read one verse from Psalm 145, Psalm 145, but I want you, uh, starting if you could bring up the entire Psalm uh, 145, I would appreciate it. I want us to read this together this morning as I uh, want to begin a new series called The, the Greatness of God and uh, How Great Is Our God. And uh, I, I have had this on my heart for some time, and I had to do a series because you can't preach it all in one message. And I found that out the more I searched the greatness of God. I thought this is going to have to be a series because I, there, this is too much to talk about. And I'm going to be talking about a lot today. But if we can put up Psalm 145, and that's not my, that's not my uh, uh, verses that I'm going to be preaching from today. But uh, I'm going to take the third verse. That's going to be my series title, uh, a series verse that we use. But I want us to read this together. I love it. And uh, it's just a beautiful psalm that kicks off the hallelujah psalms that are going to follow. Uh, psalm 146, 47, 149, 48, 49, and 50 are hallelujah psalms. This kicks it off. It prepares you to praise the Lord. And so let's read it together. Amen. I wonder if we all can stand. Let's just all stand and let's read this together. I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day. Will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Let's say that again. That's my key verse. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. Amen. Let's say that to each other right now. Let's just look at your partner and say, one generation shall pray, praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and uh, of thy wondrous works, and men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness, and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All thy Works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. 
They shall speak of thy glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and his glorious majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all those that bow down. The eyes of all wait upon thee Thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thine hand and satisfieth the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all, that, all the wicked will be destroyed. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Amen. Let's give the Lord and his word a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Great is the Lord. Hallelujah. And greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. God is good, isn't he? And I want to preach uh, on the greatness of God over the next several weeks. I don't know how long this is going to go, not into Easter, I hope, but uh, I don't know. It just depends on where it all leads me. I just know it was way too much for one sermon. And so uh, we're going to get into it. And I don't think I've ever preached a series on the greatness of God, but the Lord laid this on my heart. And then uh, also the song service kind of just went with everything. And uh, I told Ryan, I said, turn around and look at my sermon. And uh, he turned around. We had it up there before service started, the outline. And he just looked at me with eyes wide open. And I thought, wow, this is working out great. Amen. So I turned to Acts chapter 17. That's where my text is at. Uh, this just started. I was just going to use that third verse as my, uh, in Psalm 145, as my key verse. And we'll be talking, and I hope you can memorize that verse over the next several weeks. Uh, but uh, it's a blessed psalm even to memorize uh, that Psalm 145. But Acts 17, uh, verses 15 through 33 is going to be in my text. I'll be reading from that in just a few moments. Uh, but uh, at a youth conference, uh, Youth for Christ, and Billy Graham, how many know, he started out his ministry in Youth for Christ as an evangelist. And soon, early in his ministry, uh, some guy, uh, a student at one of the schools there, said to him, uh, asked him a question right off the cuff and said, what kind of guy is God? <laughs> Kind of took back Billy, and he had to think about that for a while, and actually we don't know exactly how he responded it, but Billy had made mention to, of that several times uh, through his ministry that that was one of the most profound questions that was ever asked of him, what kind of go guy <laughs> is God? Whether the guy was being facetious or being a smart aleck or really inquisitive and sincere, uh, we don't know that. All we know is that was a question that he asked, and it's a question that the world asks. It's a question that all of us ask at one time or another in our life. We might not call him a guy, but we'll say, what kind of God is this that we're serving today? And it's a good question to ask, but it cannot be answered very easily. We've got to answer it from the Word of God, and we trust that God will use this message today just to kick it off and get you thinking about how great God is, because it will change the way you look at life, the way you live your life. It'll change everything about your perspective on the situations, your troubles, your trials, your difficulties, everything you're going through in life. I'm telling you, your concept of the greatness of God is what will carry you through uh, uh, every situation if you really firmly believe it in your heart. Amen? And so God help us to really get this burned in our heart. And uh, in Acts chapter 17, Paul has just started in chapter 16, his second missionary journey. Him and Silas uh, have been call, heard the Macedonian call, went over into uh, Macedonia, came and began to preach down through Thessalonica and Berea after he Philippi. They had a great revival in Philippi. And then they moved down to uh, Thessalonica and had a great revolt there, a riot. And they almost tried to throw Paul out of the town. And he was escorted out by his own men to protect his life and uh, left uh, uh, Silas 
Titus and Timothy, uh, who had just joined the band uh, there with them, young men uh, that were following with Paul with his team. And if you read the early parts of chapter 17, he moves on down to Berea. And at Berea, uh, there's, they receive him. They, uh, this is a people that were sincere with God, so where they searched the word of God daily and were hungry for the things of God. And Paul had a great move of God in Berea. And then the Thessalonians heard that God was moving there, the evil people up there, the Jews, and all those that were uh, jealous of Paul. And they came down and stirred up a riot. So Paul had to be escorted out of Berea and ended up going down to Athens. And he's at Athens now. And that's where the scripture is going to start. He goes into Athens. This is the capital of Greece. And uh, 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 just a, 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 an amazing city compared to the others. When he walked into Athens, it's like, whoa, this is uh, almost breathtaking, even though uh, it had been at a period of decline uh, since the first century, and it had, had a, uh, 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 just a, a famous university and numerous beautiful buildings, but it had lost its glory compared to Rome. That was the big center now. But still, Athens was quite a uh, quite a, an amazing, amazing uh, city to enter into. And he leaves and enters in, and he's kind of breathtaking by all of it. But he didn't come there to be a sightseer. He came there to be a soul winner. Hallelujah. And even though it was kind of majestic and big and everything else, that didn't faze him. First thing he did, he goes into the marketplaces and begins to preach the gospel and into the, into the synagogues and preach the gospel. And word began to spread throughout the entire uh, city that there was a strange guy bringing a strange doctrine about a strange God uh, that had been raised from the dead by the name of Jesus. And the next thing you know, they've called him uh, down to, to the, the courts uh, there in Athens uh, uh, to debate with him and have him share his concepts of this God that he was speaking of because uh, uh, Athens was known uh, for being very idolatrous uh, 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 city and had more gods. They said they had more gods in Athens than they did men. <laughs> kind of like the Hindu religion. They got over a billion, uh, several billion uh, gods that they worship and anything that moves becomes a god. And even if it doesn't move, uh, they call it a god in the Hindu religion. And it gets to be very, 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 very uh, confusing. So Paul is down here and he is getting ready uh, to, to, to answer questions and to share his faith with those that are there. And I want you to turn your Bibles and to save some time, uh, let's just, uh, well, let's just start with verse 15, and uh, I'll read it as quick as I can here to you. Amen. S Acts chapter 17, verse 15. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment uh, unto Silas and Timotheus, for to come to him with all speed they departed. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore, disputed he in the, <clears throat> in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the markets daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans, and uh, we'll talk about them in a minute, <clears throat> the Stoics encountered him, and some said, what will this babbler say? Others, other sums, they said, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Aragopas, Aragopas and that was a, the court uh, house there in uh, like the Supreme Court in Athens, saying, may we know what this doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest uh, certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. And all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. That was their big deal. <clears throat> Then Paul stood in the midst of Bar's Hill. That was there. That's why the Aragopas got its name from this, this marble rock that was right there in Athens. A massive rock is still there to this day. And they call it Mars Hill. Uh, and this is where the courts uh, began to meet. And uh, 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 Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotion, I found an order with the inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore 
ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. You don't know him, but I do. God had made the world and all things, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their heaven. And they that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. And in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as ye are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the God the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by the art and a man's device and the times of this ignorance God winked at but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day uh, a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him. We'll stop there. Lord, bless your word. Lord, anoint it with your power and might. Let your glory and greatness be seen this morning, and we will bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I get all stirred up here, as you can tell, when I get into my sermons and stirred. But you got to remember, I've been thinking about this for a week, almost a week and a half. And uh, uh, I, 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 the more I think about it, my wife says, you just got to stop thinking about it so much. So you preach too much and put too much in it. But I want to try to keep it as short and simple as I can because we have a lot to say over the next few weeks. Uh, but I trust that God's going to help us and uh, uh, get through this. But here they courteously invited Paul to come and to minister to them. And uh, uh, Paul knew he was mingling with the people that were a bunch of idolatries. Uh, they, they were canceling out court culture, and they were just filled with all kinds of, of wrong thinking about God, and their lives were all messed. Kind of reminds you of America that we're living in, and everybody got their own little idea of what's right and what's wrong, almost like the days of the age judges when every man did that was right with his own, own eyes and didn't matter what God's Word said or what God revealed. Uh, everybody just wanted to carry their own thoughts and beliefs about everything. And uh, you know where that leads to? It leads to confusion. It leads to death. It leads to destruction. It leads to a, a messed up life. And, and uh, people have tried all their life to get away from the truth of God's word. But I'm always leads them down a path of destruction every time. And yet they've never learned. They never will learn. They're bent on being uh, 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 sidetracked by evil and uh, deceived by the devil and can't see it. But today, Paul looks them in the eye and he starts preaching to them. And he says, you have this God that you, you worship and, and, and this, this monument you've made to this unknown God. And you have no clue what you, you have all these uh, gods made out of stone and bone and silver and gold and all everywhere you look, you see statues and gods and people worshiping. And, and now you got this one, one to the unknown God that you've put up. It's, it's like, hey, you don't want to miss any. You might miss one. So it's like the tomb of the unknown soldier. They got one there just in case they missed one of the uh, soldiers that got killed. They happen to represent all the ones that they never found. They never knew. And so I think it's wonderful. But here, this is a tomb to the unknown God. Because they, they don't know if they got the right one yet. They've had thousands and they still didn't know if they had the right one. Aren't you thankful that we know? We know who God is. Hallelujah. And Paul says, I've come to tell you who the unknown God is. Because I know him. I found him. I didn't always know him, but now I do. And I've come to share with you the truth about God. And he let them know what kind of guy God is. So I titled my message, What Kind of Guy? is God. So the, the people out there in, in, the, in the Facebook land, they might be attracted by the title because they think God is just a guy. 
But I got news for you. He's a lot greater than any guy that ever was born and brought into this world. And he's the great and the mighty God that we want to share with you. And so he begins his, un- his introduction uh, about this unknown God uh, by saying, God, verse 24, the God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. He is the God that made the world and everything. And so he starts out with Genesis 1-1. That's a good place to start out if you want to talk about God. In the beginning was God. In the beginning was God. And all things were made by him. Hallelujah. The heavens and the earth. And that's where he begins to just tackle this and lets them go. He takes them back to the days of Moses when he penned those words to let us know that our God, our great God, first of all, is the creative God. Everything that you see, everything that you look at when you look in a mirror, everything that you see in this world, God was the instrument that created all of this or gave the wisdom and the understanding and the mentality to have it created. But God is the one that brought the trees and the birds and the cows and humanity and the stars and the sun and everything into existence. The God that I worship is the creator. Hallelujah. And so he starts with that found fundamental truth. And believe me, yeah. You're going to struggle through life if you do not believe that God created all this. If you thought it just happened uh, in, in a bubble and it's just an explosion, I'm telling you, the Epicureans believe that and the Stoics believe that with all their wisdom and all their knowledge uh, uh, that they had. And they were so wise, but it was worldly wisdom and it led them down a path of destruction. But Paul says, I got, I got news for you. The God that I serve is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And, uh, and God did it so perfectly. Just think about it. Uh, uh, this, this thought that the earth is just made perfectly in this universe that we live in. Yeah. Right distance from the sun so that the water can exist in its liquid state, which is vital for life to exist. They've been searching for Mars, to next one to us, to see if there's any possibility of water. And they keep saying there is, there is, there is, but they haven't found any yet. Everything they ever found there is all dried up just rocks and dust and craziness and they, they can search for it, but man is just trying to prove with everything that lies within him, but there's life somewhere else out there. Uh, but earth was made exactly where God needed to have it. Five degrees closer, our atmosphere would have been like Venus, and our temperatures would have been 900 degrees. I'd take that over the last two weeks any day. <laughs> but if we... Five five percent more and distant from of the sun than we would be like Mars and frozen to death. And how many have felt like you've been like in Mars the last couple of weeks? I've felt that way, but I'm telling you, nothing can compare. Can you imagine 900 degrees? Just five degrees difference, both ways, would have changed everything and would there be no life. And don't tell me that God didn't situate us right where he did. We're on a purpose so that life could exist here. Our moon stabilizes the earth's axis, thereby giving us the seasons and the tides which are vital to life. Our atmosphere is rich with oxygen needed to support life, and it blocks the gamma rays and the UV rays and the X-rays and the light that does penetrate is that which is just perfect to to give us what we need to live with. Even our address in the Milky Way. I mean, it's massive, the Milky Way. Think of it, and where God placed us right there, the address of the earth is perfect for humanity. I'm telling you, that's where God uh, comes into the picture here. This could not just have happened. And one little girl asked her mother, where did people come from? And she said, honey, A long time ago, God made Adam and Eve, and they had children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren until the whole earth was filled with people, and that's where we come from. And a few days later, she said, Daddy, where did we come from? He says, well, many, many billions of years ago, there was a great explosion. Out of that explosion came some monkeys, and from those monkeys, uh, they they mutated into uh, different things, and finally, they become a human being, and we, we came from monkeys. And so the little girls were confused, so she went and seen her mom and said, Mom... You said we come from 
you said you came from, from God and, and all the creation of people, but Dad said we came from monkeys. Who, who's right? And she says, oh, we're both right. She says, what do you mean? She says, my, my ancestry came from God. His came from monkeys. <laughs> so if you want to be a monkey, be a monkey. You want to be an animal, be an animal. That's what the world's acting like today. But those that know God, those that believe he created them, in his image, I'm telling you, those have a, an understanding uh, uh, that we are greater than any animal. God gave us dominion over all the world. And I'm telling you, that's the position God has placed human beings in. And those that acknowledge him, hallelujah, have the greatness of God in their hearts. And I thank God I did not come from a monkey. Amen. Uh, I've had many, many monkeys. In my lifetime, we had them all around our house. We had some chimps and uh, uh, all kinds of uh, animals around our house. I just thank God that I had dominion over them and they didn't have dominion over me. God is good. And uh, I'm telling you, there's a, a lot in that. David said this, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and thy soul and my soul knoweth right well. Do you know your God? Hallelujah. I mean, that was written thousands of years ago when David didn't even understand half of what we understand about this world and know about this human body. But the more we know about it, the more it lets me know this could not just have happened. It come from a great designer God, the creator of the worlds. What kind of God is God? He's a creative God. But not only is he a creative God, he's a caring God. That's the marvel of this. Though he's great and majestic and marvelous and, and fills the universe and fills the world, yet God knows each one of you by name. He knows your heart. He knows the hairs on your head. He knows everything about you, and he cares for you. Verse 25 uh, says it this wonderful way. Neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth life to all, and breath, and all things. Isn't that beautiful? He lets us know, hey, though he's way out there, he knows right where you're sitting. AJ, he has your name. He has your number. He knows everything about you. He knows where you live. He knows the color of your couch. He knows more about what's in your house than you do. I'm telling you. He knows more about my house than I knew. I mean, I crawled underneath my base basement the other week and got bit by a round, brown recluse spider. And it took my daughter-in-law to let me know you've just been bit by a spider because it's just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And I'm just thinking, this pimple has got to go away. And I kept putting medicine on it throughout the day. And she come that night, she looked and said, Brother Roy, that's a spider bite. I said, oh. You're right, that is a spider bite. I better get to see a doctor. So I went the next day and put me on some antibiotics, doing great. But I'm telling you, God knew that spider was there. I didn't know it. He did. He said, hey, I'm going to make him aware. <laughs> All these creatures, small and great, were created by me. Hallelujah. And every once in a while, God lets us get bit by one of them to let us know, hey, I'm in control of all of this, and you better give me the recognition I need in, in this world, for I am the one that takes care of of you. Amen. Oh, yeah. And uh, the Lord has been good to me. He's taken care of me, Tim. And uh, many a time I've been down sick and weary and well, I've just placed my hand and prayed. I've asked God to help, to heal, not just myself, my family, my children in this church. And we've seen the greatness of God in taking care of his own people. Every good gift, James says, and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, lights with whom there is no variable, there's no changing at all, neither shadow of turning. That is our God. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I got news for you. God cares about you. And the time we have on earth is a gift from God. And God can take it away from you anytime he wants to. And don't you think he can't? And if you're here today, it's only by the grace and goodness of God, Steve. He can take us out of the picture so fast. People have found that with the coronavirus, perfect health, and all of a sudden, overnight, dead. 
overnight practically. Life changes for families. For God's just letting us know, hey, your life is in my hand. I faced the coronavirus from the very beginning saying, hey, my life's in the hand of God. I get it, I get it. If I don't get it, I don't get it. I'm in the hands of God and I am not afraid to die. I'm not. I don't want to make my family suffer through it. I want God to do it quick, but that might be what is going to happen. It might be a slow process. My wife might have to nurse me along, and, and uh, it might be a hard thing for her. But uh, you don't always get what you want in life. My father-in-law didn't. At 72, he passed away and suffered with cancer for a year. One of the most godly, great men's, uh, men I ever met in my entire life. And why? I don't understand. All I know is this God is good. He works all things for good to them that love him. And that's what my father-in-law said to me in this dire situation that he was in, facing death. He says, Romans 8, 28 says this, Royce, and you better believe it. I believe it. All things work together for good to them uh, that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. And he says, either you believe it or you don't, and I believe it. Isn't that wonderful? I've said that so many times in here, but you can't say it enough. You cannot say enough. Either you believe it or you don't believe it. God cares about you and me. Our life is in his hand. And when it's over, it's over. And until it's over, it'll never be over. And I don't care all the forces of hell that Satan would bring against us. I've had AK-47s. I've been through all kinds of war situations and overthrows of governments. Been in situations where we didn't know if we were going to live or die within the next five minutes of busting on our door. We didn't know they attacked the home right next to us in Maborka. Came in and seized the property and everything. We thought our house was next. All our kids were just sitting down and praying that God would spare us. They left our house and went to the next house. Bypassed right over us. Whole army, a coup, an overthrow. And here we are protected by the hand of God. Oh, I could go on with many, many stories. I could get caught away with it. But all I know is my life is in the hand of God. And every bit of time that we have on earth is a gift from Him. Let's use it well for the glory of God. Our talents, our skills, what we have comes from God. Don't think that this is your own ingenuity or your own abilities. And whatnot. It was a gift given to you by God. Use those gifts for the glory of God. If it's to plow a church parking lot, plow a church parking lot. Tony didn't even know he had a gift. He had never plowed a parking lot in his life. And he whipped in and he plowed the whole thing a couple of weeks ago when we had that first snow and uh, called me, uh, and sent a message, said, hey, have you seen the parking lot? I said, no. He said, well, take a look at it. I looked at, I put my camera on, uh, on my phone and looked up. I said, hey, you did that? He says, yeah, I've never plowed before in my life, but I did it. And if next snow comes in, I'll plow it again. I thought, hey, this is good practice for you. I couldn't believe it. Did it. How many, beautiful job, huh, on the parking lot? That's the second time of plowing with that truck. Yeah, he only hit the bus four times in the van three, but no, I just... <laughs> <laughs> did a great job. I, I appreciate that. and uh, It means so much to me when you have talents. And <clears throat> Many times, Brother Roy, has, uh, many, many times I've shoveled all around this church when snow's come in. I like to shovel snow. But I had that brown recluse bite on my hand, and it was very sore and swollen. And I get a phone call from James saying, Brother Roy, can I, can I, uh, I want to, I, oh, he called and says, Brother Roy, uh, a couple of weeks, a week ago, he says, if you need somebody to help you pl shovel out the drive, the church, let me know. And I told him, don't worry about it, James. I can get it. But if I get ready to do, I'll call you. James called me yesterday or, the, or Friday and said, Brother Roy, I shoveled all around the church. I got a shovel. And he didn't know that I had the brown recluse bite. And he didn't know that I wasn't about to be out there shoveling snow. And uh, it was all taken care of. Knowing that your talents, your gifts, whatever it is, Young, you have strength, and that's your glory. And you use that strength for the glory of God. It's a gift from God. As you get older, you use your gray hair, your wisdom, and you use that for the glory of God. Your talents come from God. Marlene asked me, Can you know anybody in church can help me with my taxes? I said, I thought for a long time. I said, It's not me, that's for sure. It's not me. I, I can't help you with anything. Then I said, Hey, Terry Clay might be able to help. Call Terry. Terry thanked me for having her call him. And uh, he, he said, thanks for offering my help, you know. I said, well, I thought if anybody could figure out the taxes, he would be Terry. And he helped her, got her through that situation. And that's the body of Christ. That's the family of God. Our talents, our gifts, all that we have comes from God. Hallelujah. And I love it when God use, God's people use what God gives them for his glory. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And uh, our purpose in life 
is a gift from God. Our families, our parents, our grandparents, our, our, our husbands, our wives, they're all a gift from God. I keep trying to let my wife know that. <laughs> Honey, I'm your gift from God. And she says, oh my word. God made a mistake. No. <laughs> My greatest joy in life is my children. They're a heritage of the Lord, a gift from God. And every one of my children that were born were born as a gift from God. And we, we, uh, we just wanted our quiver full of them, that God would bless us. And one of our children, a second one born, uh, was a miscarriage, and we lost uh, the, uh, our, first chi- our second child. But we even considered that a gift, and we longed for the day that we see uh, him or her in heaven. And uh, what a day that will be. And those are experiences that we went through in life. And, and uh, I just considered every one of them a blessing. I didn't understand it at the time, but later on, I was able to mis- minister to families that were going through miscarriages and tragic things. And, and I've shared some of those stories with you and how God used our hardship and our difficulties in life to prepare us to minister to others and to weep with them and to cry with them and to feel what they're feeling and know it's real. It's really real. And that happened to us in Africa, thousands of miles away from anybody to help us and how the Lord ministered and got us through that crisis. And I just let you know, God cares about you and me. And I could go on with a million illustrations how God has taken care of my family down through the years. And uh, he's never failed me yet. He said, cast your care upon me because I care for you. All I can say to you, cast it on to God. Cast it on to God. And he can handle it. Amen? He's a great, great, caring God. I love that. Created us, and he can take care of us. And last of all, he's a commanding God. Verses 26 and 28, it says, uh, through 28, it says this, and hath made of one blood, and it was of Adam, all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your poets have said, for we are also his offspring. He created all people of the world from one man. And from that one man, we are here today. Amen? Unless, unless you come from a monkey. I don't think anybody believe here that you came from a monkey. If not, if you do, please stay afterwards. We have to have a long, long talk. I have a whole series of pictures of monkeys, and I want to see which one that you came from. Um, <laughs> But the gods of the Greeks, they were distant. They were pieces of stone or bone or silver or gold or or pictures. They were distant and they couldn't relate to them. They couldn't talk to them. They couldn't speak to them. And if they did, they didn't get a response. There was no feeling. There was no touch. But here we, we can feel God. We can sense God. What Paul said, the God that I serve, hallelujah, he's in my heart. I can sense his presence in my life, his peace, his joy, his love. And experiencing all that lets me know that my God, hallelujah, is control, in control of everything in my being, my life, my breath, everything that I am. It comes from God. They sing about it so well uh, this, this morning. And I tell you, it's the sovereignty of God. He's the commander-in-chief. He is in command of everything. And uh, that word sovereign, uh, that always baffled me, that word when I was going to theology, had theology and we had to do a thesis on, on the sovereignty of God. I, I remember that in Romans. We had to do, a, he asked us to write on several of the doctrines of God and what was the sovereignty of God. I had no clue. I'd never heard the word before. And I'm thinking, wow, I was like my second day at Bible school. And I had to write a thesis on uh, five of the major doctrines in Romans. And I got a zero on my term paper. 
it was the first, not term paper, it was a, a, a and here, here he was wanting to show us how stupid we were. And Brother Beam did a really excellent job teaching me how much I did not know about the things of God. And from that day on, I determined to learn more and more and more about God. But to help all of you that were like me, that didn't know a thing about the sovereignty of God, what that word sovereignty means is above or superior to all others. The chief, the greatest, the supreme, the supreme in power and rank and authority. A person who possesses sovereign authority or power. If someone is sovereign, he is boss. The buck stops with him, and he is in control of it all. Amen? And uh, he is the commander and chief. The Bible says this in Jeremiah 21, verse 8, And unto this people thou shalt say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. I have it all under my control. I'm the commander of it. And with one breath, one word, I can change the entire destiny of your life. That's how much I am the commander in chief. I am the sovereign. My word is the final word. And when I speak, it shall be done. And you and, and no one else on the face of the earth can change that. He depends on nobody, Steve. Nobody. He's God. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. He's God. He's self-existent and he's all-powerful. But he wants you. He desires you. He doesn't need you. He can make it fine without you. He did for, for eternity before you ever came into existence. This is all his plan because he's a God of love. And we can be as close to God as we want to be. That's what Paul's saying here. And uh, I just love that. And uh, You need to believe in the sovereignty of God when you have a close relative. Just, Sterling just went through that this last couple of weeks with his stepdad and, was praying for Jim and didn't know if he's going to live or die. Been going through the COVID and then had heart complications, had heart surgery, and everything went sour and looked like he was going, they were going to lose him. And and this was just last week before Sunday service. And and uh, I called Sterling. I said, "Well, we're going to cancel service. We don't know what's going to happen with you two and the snow and everything else. We're canceling. I, I want you to be free to go to to Decatur if you have to." And we had that conversation. We prayed. We prayed and prayed. And uh, God turned the situation around. He's doing tremendous right now. And we thank the Lord for that. God is so good, isn't he? Uh, but when close friends or relatives are in the ICU, I want you to know God is in control. When the economy, whether it's national or whether it's personal, uh, and it's on a slide and things are just reeling back and forth, I want you to know this. God is in control. When tyrants or terrorists rage out of control, God is in control. He orchestrates and determines what he is do, going to do in your life, in my life, in the president's life, and in our senators and our congressmen and women. He's got it all under control. I know that some of them think they're the ultimate answer. They think they have everything under control. i got news for them. They are the most deceived people on the face of the earth. And if you think that our president is the supreme commander-in-chief, you got, i got another word for you. He is not. Jesus Christ is. Our God is. And I'm telling you, the wisest thing a president can do is to bow his knee to God and swear on that Bible, and say, God, I am not the commander-in-chief. You are the commander-in-chief of my life, and I submit myself to you. And until a president does that, I fear for his soul. Yeah. And I love it when they do acknowledge God. And I love it when I hear it even out of our president's mouth when he acknowledges God. But we better do more than just acknowledge God. You better accept him as the sovereign commander and chief of your life. And uh, that's what it means to be serving the commanding God. And when you bow your head to pray, and when you're in a jam and you need to ask God for something, I want you to know that He is able. Hallelujah. I don't care what it is. I could go, I could get a catalog of things I could say. On Tuesday, I do a little devotion with my 
grandchildren down in Granite City, uh, Sherry, uh, they put us on Zoom. My wife and I share stories from Africa where God did something great for us, or even from America. Right now we're in Africa, and just marvelous things that God has done. Answered prayers, crazy prayers, stupid prayers, impossible prayers. Prayed the most ridiculous prayers in the world, and to see God do it, to see it happen. This is, I, I just said, if, if I hadn't, if this had not been my experience, I wouldn't believe it. And if I didn't have my wife to evidence it, you just couldn't believe it happened, but it did. This is marvelous. And we just, God, one time we prayed, I, I'm going to share this. Better not share it. They might see it. I won't, I won't share it. And uh, it's just, I can think of hundreds of illustrations of, of just prayers alone where God manifested his power and spoke from heaven and worked a miracle in my life, in my family's life, in other people's lives. It's like, whoa, this is a great and a mighty God that has it all under control. <laughs> And I can only imagine the eyebrows that were lifted when Paul was preaching to him that day. And they'd go, oh, we never heard anybody like this. Someone raised from the dead, this guy named Jesus. And I'm telling you, they were getting a little antsy. And, and uh, uh, it, was just, it was just almost kind of hilarious. And Paul was having the time of his life uh, reminding them and us that God is in control. He created it all. Hallelujah. He cares about it all, and he's in control and commanding every situation in life. And he cho chose to close his sermon uh, with, with an appeal to them to, to, to acknowledge God. And he says this in verse 28 through 31. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of our own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are his, the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by the art of man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. So he makes an appeal to them at the end of this message, and he says, look, you're going to die. And Jerry looks at me and says, I know but not now. And you're going to stand before the judge of all mankind. He created you, and he's going to judge you. And he says, God has called for you to come into relationship with him, and the only way you can do that is to repent. Repent of your sin. Bow your knee and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he went to that cross and died for your sin and that God raised him again to, to, to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you. And he, he, I'm sure he, he kept this sermon. This is only just a skim of the sermons. Luke was uh, uh, writing this sermon. He probably went on a whole lot more and explained how Jesus arose from the dead and the reason why he, he bled and died. But the essence of this is he's calling them to come into relationship with God because that's really what it's all about. Why does God, why did he create you? To have a relationship with you. Why does he care about you? To have a relationship with you. Why does he control and command everything in your life and do all these crazy things, wonderful things in your life? It's because he wants to have a relationship with you and he wants you to depend on him. That's what it's all about. And so Paul ends his sermon by appealing with them. Repent. Come to know me. And my God, he loves you. He died for you. And God proved that by raising him from the dead. And God has accepted his sacrifice for your sin. And if you bow your knee to him, you'll find life is in our God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then he says this. Verse 32, he says, and some mocked him. <laughs> and that's what people are going to do. With many of the things that we say, they mock us. They think it's a big joke. They even attack us. They despise us. They hate us. Because... We tell the truth, and they cannot stand the truth. They hate it because it goes against all their idolatry, all their witchcraft, all the gods that they serve, whether it's government or whether it's actual gold and silver uh, and materialism of this world. What, people have so many gods. He says, 
Whatever you're bowing your knee to, that's what you're worshiping. Repent of it. Repent of it. There's only one year to worship, and it's God Almighty. And many, most people will mock that, make fun of that, and live their foolish lives and die in their sin without God. Most. That's right. But then he says, then the others said, well, let us think about this a little bit longer. Uh, we're going to have another consultation with the reader. Verse 32. Let's think about it. We're going to come back to you and talk to you a little bit more. You've given us an awful lot to think about. At least they're thinking. Most people don't even think. They've already made up their mind. They're going to do what they want to do. And I know I'm not talking to those type of people in this church today, but that's where the world, most of the world's like that. But then the Bible says, some of them believed. Some of them began to follow after Paul's words. And I love it. I've preached to hundreds of people, thousands probably over the years, and uh, some have mocked. Some have gone thought about it, and some later on came to know the Lord. Some decided, no, they didn't want God in their life. And then others have believed. And it brings the greatest joy in my heart to see one believe. And can you imagine the joy it brings to the heart of God when someone bows their knee and says, Lord, I accept you as my Savior and Lord. And this morning, if you don't know him, he bled and died and arose again from the dead. And I know that most of you do, but there might be one that doesn't. If you don't know him and you like to know him, it's so simple. All you can do is repent. Say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin, and I accept you as my Savior that died and rose again. And from this day, I'm going to live for you, Lord, for you're the great and the mighty God. And the moment you make that decision and make that prayer, life will change for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. 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 Ha, great is our God. Lord, deal with every heart, every life this morning, this sitting here. And if there's one that's struggling with their faith, struggling with believing in your greatness and your ability to do all things in their life, they're even struggling with why they're here, why, they were, why they're in this world that they just, it just became a, 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 something that was, it just came into existence by itself. Lord, eradicate that thought and let them realize you created them for a purpose and that you love them and care about them and you want to take control of their lives and that they would come to a place that they would bow their knee and acknowledge you as the great God and Savior of their soul. Lord, deal with every heart of everyone that's watching this on Facebook, Lord. We don't know who will turn this on in the present or maybe years from now and see this. And Lord, be confronted with the same appeal that Paul made to the Athenians that day. Lord, that there would be some that would say, here I am, Lord. I believe and I accept you as my Savior. Lord, what joy it brings to heaven over one soul that's found. And God, I pray you do that work in every heart in life. And God, as we exalt you as the great and mighty God over the weeks to come, I trust that you'll bring each one of us into a closer, deeper, more wonderful relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. How many know that God is great? He's great. He's a great God, isn't he? Hallelujah. And uh, they're going to sing about that again. I want us to all stand again. In honor of a great God. You know, when the president walks in a room, they all stand up. They all stand. I would too. I would respect him. I know some pastors, when they walk into church, everybody stands and recognizes them. I don't want that. Uh uh-uh. uh. But when God walks in, hallelujah. When his word is being preached, when we're praising his name, when we're exalting him, that's a time to stand. That's the time to raise your hands and your heads towards the heaven. That's the time to let your heart exalt God for who he is, the great and mighty God. Hallelujah. Unsearchable are his ways. He's the great and mighty God. Amen. Listen to this wonderful old hymn. I love this song. One of the first, ever, first time I ever heard this song was played on a harp. We, my wife and I, I wasn't married then. She, they took me to a, a guy playing a harp. And, they, and I'd never heard how great thou art before ever. And they said that. And I said there were tears. I was playing a harp. I'd never heard this before. It's so beautiful. And I just said, I thought, this has got to be 
the most glorious course in the world. Listen to it. listening and while they're singing this song I want to open up the altars if you want to come and lift the need before God maybe on someone else's need or problem or something you're facing something that's impossible you believe that God will hear your prayer and that God will answer and you need him to do that I'm telling you many of my answers to my prayers have happened at an altar of prayer God has healed me God has provided for me God has met my family met my ministry, done works in my life that's changed me many, many times at an altar, maybe at home or right in church at these altars many times. I've knelt here and had the whole church come and pray for me and my family, going through difficult times and seeing God open up the windows of heaven, make a way where there's no way. This morning, these altars are open. I want them to sing. And those that have to go, you're free to go, but I want the altars to stay open. If you want to take some time to come and kneel before your maker, don't be in a big hurry. Recognize him for who he is and let God do that work and meet you where you are. He cares for you. He cares for you. Sing it again. He's all for you.
words of acclamation and lead me home. What joy shall fill my heart, then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great Thou art.
God that depends on no one, that Lord, you have everything under control and you care about us. God, I pray that you take these words, plant them deep in our hearts, and we take them home and plant them in our children's hearts, into the next generation's heart, and that we let the world know that we serve a great and a mighty King. Hallelujah. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Your ways are unsearchable. And to you, we give all the glory, all the praise in Jesus. That name that's above every other name, Jesus. In Jesus' name.